Welcome to the Success Pick and Mix podcast. I'm your host, Nikki Raby, a professional pick and mixer. I'm a personal brand coach, a speaker, an actor, a creator, and a podcaster. I'm on a mission to help you find and create your version of success, your pick and mix of life and business on your terms, a blend that complements your personality, your goals, and your circumstances. Since 2018, I've been sharing interviews and mini episodes to help you unlock your next step, to make it real and make it happen. Round here, we dream big. We go for the ideal version. We talk about money and make moves our future selves would be proud of. This podcast is free and available for you whenever you need it. So do rate, review and subscribe for new episodes. If you want to go deeper with my support, check out my freebies house and unlock the rooms you choose. NikkiRaby.com forward slash freebies house. I also have workshops, programs and one-on-one bespoke offerings. For prices and availability, go to NikkiRaby.com. Thank you, as always, for spending some time with me and my guests. Now, on to today's episode. In today's episode, I'm talking to Pip Jameson, who is the founder of The Dots, which is, if you don't know already, the LinkedIn for creatives, as named by Forbes. I was so honoured to be able to talk to Pip. Thank you so much to Rowena if you're listening to this for the little hookup. I really appreciate it. I wanted to talk to Pip about building a company. Sometimes even putting ourselves online or launching a service or saying that we charge for something can feel like a huge emotional situation. But Pip's built a company and not only she built one, she's bought two. She started in Australia and has come over and done something very similar in the UK. She has so much knowledge to share. It's a really meaty episode that I'm sure you'll love. So if you want to come and join in the conversation, please do. We'll be over on Instagram at Nikki Raby or the show notes will be NikkiRaby.com forward slash podcast. And also, if you love the episode, please rate, review, subscribe, share on iTunes iTunes, all that good stuff. I really want to get to a million plays by the end of the year, which may sort of, is well, it's sort of starting to seem possible, which is very exciting. So um, without further ado, here's Pip, here's the episode. Enjoy, my friends. Pip, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> oh, I'm so happy to talk to you. Um, I would love to know um, more about you and the brilliant thing that you've built. Oh, oh well, um, gosh, I guess I'm, I'm the founder of The Dots, uh, which Forbes really kindly called the next LinkedIn. Um, uh, we look after what I love to call no-collar workers. So what on earth do I mean by no-collar workers? These are creatives, creators, freelancers, entrepreneurs, um, people who LinkedIn just wasn't really working for. Um, I started the business three years ago and yeah, it's just been this amazing roller coaster ride to where we are now, I guess. <laughs> Fantastic. Did you always know that you wanted to be an entrepreneur? Did, were you the person at school who was like, actually, I think I could do this better? <laughs> No, not at all. I was, I mean, I literally, I was never, I I never thought I'd be an entrepreneur. I don't think it even like hit my brain that entrepreneurship was like even a possibility. So I, the the whole idea kind of came about because I used to work in the creative industries primarily for, for MTV and I was just surrounded by mates that were working in this really different way than that traditional like white collar workforce. And I just wanted to design a different way that worked for us in our careers. So helped us promote ourselves, helped us connect with each other, but also helped us connect with amazing opportunities. So no, I was never one of those like, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. It was like literally just saw a real world problem and was like, wait a sec, LinkedIn doesn't work for me and my friends and a lot of 
well, most of the creative industries and freelancers and increasingly millennials. And so, yeah, it was just it was just trying to design a solution. So there's a better way to, to build our careers. <laughs> Definitely. Because also you can't say to people, you certainly couldn't in the small northern town that I grew up in, like, I want to be a personal brand and sort of <laughs> let me be, let me come forward with my personal brand. Because people, people don't get it. People need to see that sort of tangible thing. And certainly when I moved to London, you know, I went to drama school. So I did have some contacts trying to um, move out from the sort of training ground into the world of work. But I still, I think I said it in a podcast a while ago, it would have been so much easier if my dad was a rock star and my mum was a supermodel. <laughs> like, it's so annoying that they were teachers and solicitors and sensible jobs. <laughs> and that's a massive problem. It's like the creative industries are just, it, it, you know, the majority of it has been driven by word of mouth and friends of friends of friends. And I guess... That's a huge problem. So, I mean, when we were at MTV, when I was looking to hire people, the first thing we do is like look at our little black book and um, ask if anyone knew anyone. But what suddenly started happening is we started ending up with this incredibly homogenous workforce. We all went to, had similar backgrounds, went to similar, similar universities, lived in similar areas. And like that's when creativity becomes really stale because if we all think the same then our creative output is the same and I was like there's got to be a better way for me to discover incredible people without them necessarily knowing someone who knew someone and I guess everything I've been passionate about is kind of trying to democratize creativity so it's accessible for everyone but with the kind of output that our creative output just becomes better because it's got more different diverse brains and ways of thinking and backgrounds coming into businesses and yeah that's everything I'm passionate about. <laughs> yeah it's so true and I think that sort of sense of attaching um, creativity and income has been really key and it certainly started to become a bit of a shift because certainly there was always this idea that you do it for the love or you know it's not a proper career but everything that we're working with and technology that is supporting us is mainly created by creatives and suddenly people are realizing like oh it's not just you know faffing around <laughs> it's actually <laughs> serious work that needs to be to be paid for um you you build the original um business the loop in in australia and and this is sort of the second revision how how did you begin to build a company oh gosh do you know i had no idea what i was doing <laughs> <laughs> i mean i'm a, I'm a non-tech tech founder so i mean it, it was literally as simple as um, I think it was just sheer naivety. It was yeah. like, I saw this problem. I want to fix this problem. And yeah, the first um, kind of my, my first baby, I guess, was the Loop, which is sort of a baby sister version of the Dots in Australia, which I started with a business partner called Matt Fail. And I think, you know, back then startups weren't really a thing and no one was really talking about it. And we just went into it naively. Like we had this vision for a better way to professional network and we were like let's just build it and you know it was I love kind of looking back and going wow like you know we were basically going up against LinkedIn <laughs> and we had no idea how hard that is but I think with that naivety was is, is is great because you know instead of feeling like we knew what we were doing we didn't so we we're always asking questions and we we're also always looking for better ways to do things that were than necessarily like that you know that kind of existing models and and I think that's what sort of leads to innovation but yeah I mean I had no idea what I was doing we just made it up as we went along and it sort of all started working out <laughs> yeah and it's and I love that you talk so much on YouTube and do events and things like that about that sense of the female founder and having um that leadership sort of quality to what you do because I don't think at school necessarily we're we're taught to be leaders and certainly you know at my school if you, if you put your hand up too much you were a bit bossy and you were a bit like whoa now pipe down so um so yeah it's great to have have a woman at the the forefront it really is um I I love this quote that you said about reflecting society um teams that reflect society as a whole are so much better how did you know how to build a team when you were starting out the first time around yeah, I think, I mean, MTV was such an amazing experience because I had seen how brilliant teams can operate, but also the limitations of that brilliance, which was definitely around, you know, homogenous thinking. So I guess when I was starting out in with 
you know, the first business, it was really kind of putting together pieces of puzzles of where was where were our strengths, where are our weaknesses, and what do we need to kind of tap in and make sure that that team like worked as a dynamic. And it's a constantly evolving beast because tech has moved on so much from that. You know, back then designers were called digital designers, but now like they're UI and product and UX designers. I think the thing I've learned most around the uh, along the way is. Things are moving so far, especially in the tech space, that no one's really an expert. And I think the most important thing is learning and continuous learning. And I, I'm a I'm a complete book junkie. <laughs> um, um, I'm really dyslexic, so I find it really hard to read physical books. So I just listen to audible books all the time. And I think when it came to building teams, you know, when I felt like I was struggling with that or, you know, feeling like massive imposter syndrome leading a team and I'm not really a leader. Um, <laughs> and I'm also, to... please like me, guys, because I'm really nice as well. And I hug everyone. So I think I just sort of just started reading a lot about really innovative leaders that I love and respect and people that were doing it really well. But I think, you know, you take that advice, but you then have to mold it into your own. And and I, I think something that's changed my thinking about leadership a lot and was that, um, you know, I have always been, um, this is my family. I do call them my family. Some people say that's right or wrong. I, I love hugging my team. I feel like we all support each other through the highs and lows. And I saw an amazing TEDx talk once and... It was a, a woman was basically talking about um, really caring about your staff and how that just builds loyalty. And I think I've come to believe that actually there is so much churn at the moment. So many companies are losing so many staff. And I think that's because they've just stopped putting happiness of their team at the forefront. And I think that's something I've always tried to do. So, you know, I actually have an, um, we work off something called OKRs, which are an alternative to o, uh, KPIs. <laughs> and my, my key result as a CEO is 10 out of 10 happiness for my team. Um, and it's kind of transformed everything because in the end, you know, the workforce is changing. People aren't just about getting paid as much as you want because they realize you're not necessarily going to be happy. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Um, it's a myriad of things, you know, it's flexibility so that you can spend more time with your family. It's coming to work and actually love the people you're working with. And, and I think I've kind of molded and shaped my leadership based on my own style, but also a lot of red. And that was a very long-winded answer. <laughs> it's a great answer. It's a great answer because I, I feel like... Oh gosh, I mean, you know, I went to a wedding at uh, the weekend and sometimes that sense of when you ask, you know, you don't necessarily want to ask people, so what do you do? So you get the whole CV by any means. And some people don't want to talk about work. And that's really obvious sometimes that people really just don't like what they do. And it is that case of, oh, Monday's around the corner. Oh, hump day. Oh, thank goodness. Two days till Friday. And, you know, I made a decision from a, being very small that I just didn't want to live like that. Oh, it's so true. And it's so, you know, I think a lot of people in the creative industries made that decision. You know, we're not, we're not being paid the same salaries that you get in the city, but, you know, actually salaries are good. I mean, it was so interesting what you were saying in terms of value, because I think finally people are waking up to the value of the creative industries because um, literally um, 10% of the workforce in the UK now work in the creative economy and 9% of GDP is derive from the creative economy so we are a valuable workforce but there is a deeper level of ethics that kind of sit in there where there has been as much value over you know purpose as much as paycheck enjoying the people you're working with and these are very creative industry traits but it's we've recently kind of started using the term no collar workers for our community because actually we suddenly realized there was a lot of people that weren't working in the creative industries that were signing up to the dots and we sort of started looking into it and realized it was very much being driven by kind of the uh, millennial generation, but it was because a lot of people uh, across all industries now want to experience that. You know, you work so much. Why not love what you do every day? And that is possible now. And I guess that's what we're trying to open up is you can work in these incredible jobs and love what you do every day. It is possible. <laughs> yeah, I, I really firmly believe it. And certainly when I'm saying goodbye to my son, if I'm going off to work, what I try and make it really positive because ultimately I want him to love what he's doing and that, you know, he's, 
he's not sort of counting down the days till he retires or, you know, who knows what it will be in that generation. But seeing it as something like you can earn money and really enjoy it as well. Um, I, I love how you talk about your, your dyslexia. I think it's so important to say it out loud because so many people don't or, you know, even in so many different ways, you know, hold that bit of your personality back or don't say that you find this a little bit more challenging, but you really embrace that and embrace that in your staff as well, which I think is wonderful. Yeah, I mean, gosh, like, there's no, it's, I mean, it actually kind of started because, I mean, I'm just, my dyslexia is pretty bad and my my emails are all completely riddled with typos and so I started just putting delightfully dyslexic excuse typos on my email signature because I was like I can't get everything I do properly proofed and um, I've got an amazing husband who proofs like a lot of my cons but I was like I've just you know I've just got to put it out there and then I've just you know it's just been amazing because I've always been quite open about my dyslexia but I suddenly realized that lots of people hadn't been and it's lovely when you suddenly people are get messages going oh my gosh thank you for talking about it because I've never spoken about it and now I and now I've kind of been able to talk about it at work and I think you know the more I've sort of understood my dyslexia the more I've definitely come to see it as a superpower I mean there are challenges like my spelling and reading speed is really slow but the real positives are, you know, there's 35% of entrepreneurs are dyslexic and 40% of self-made millionaires. So everyone from like Joe Malone, Richard Branson, Anita Broderick, Holly Tucker. And so it's, you know, there is a reason why so many dyslexics succeed in, in as entrepreneurs. And it's essentially because we're more creative. We're actually more empathetic. Um, and we just see the world in a different way. And I think, We've got to stop thinking about these things as negatives and realize that there's just amazing benefits that come from people with neurodiversity. And that's not just dyslexia. That's things like autism. And it's, you know, it's actually a, a, just a different brain that you can bring to a sol finding solutions to problems. So, yeah, I, I just, yeah, it's nice to kind of be talking about it because I think everyone should talk about it and everyone should hire neurodiverse people. <laughs> Certainly. And especially if you have never um, had those challenges, you know, my, one of my really good friends, her middle daughter um, has severe special needs and um, autism and you know even when I, I used to help out when she was little and even just sort of how you do locks on on the swimming pool doors or you know there's so many things to consider and actually having more um, a difference and diversity at the table it brings those sort of I went to an event actually called Make Motherhood Diverse the other week and it was so interesting just hearing everybody's experience because funnily enough we weren't all just making cakes and swanning around in, in a gingham dress <laughs> Well, yes. Yeah, so, I mean, it's so true. Like if we don't have teams that reflect society as a whole, we're basically unconsciously building solutions for ourselves. And, you know, this is actually the challenge that has happened. And actually, if we build more accessible products for everyone, it's better for everyone. And, you know, examples of this from a purely like product design, website design perspective is um, for example, when women search websites, they prefer on average to search using some sort of drop down, mm. um, while men on average prefer to use free text search. Now, the huge problem with that is with most tech products being primarily built by men, we're unconsciously building products for men. And everyone has unconscious bias. I, I'm as guilty as a, of it as the next person. I mean, like the dots are 62% female membership that's no coincidence I'm a female founder you know that is my unconscious bias building in so the thing is absolutely teams have to reflect society or we just unconsciously build products for ourselves and that's why it's so important to have a mix of different people in teams yeah definitely I'm so glad my mum always used to just say like um, whenever I was bored she'd always just say just just open your eyes and look around <laughs> then you're like oh yeah okay don't just be consumed by yourself keep looking and listening and learning and oh these things our parents say they're very wise <laughs> <Being well. laughs> and it's at that point of being in your late 30s that you're like oh no should have been nicer when I was a teenager <laughs> um do you have um do you have a, a morning routine or or things that really help you to to get focused for the day and, and what you need to do 
Oh, I, I'm so lucky because I live on a on a houseboat. <laughs> so, um, so I live on a like a a, 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 a bar. Well, no, it's not a barge. It's a narrowboat on the Regent's Canal. So, yeah, I mean, just waking up to water is just that beautiful reset I need every day. You know, we've got ducks and swans, and just looking at the water is amazing. Um, I will always either cycle or work um, walk to work because I feel like that gets my brain moving in the right direction. And I'll always read a workbook on the way to work, and I'll always read a really trashy bad novel on the way. <laughs> Um, so it's like my wind up book and then my wind down book Um, but yeah I feel like that just grounds me for the week ahead and then I'm sort of ready for action (laughs) definitely what um also as well what kind of how do you put boundaries in place because as well because you've got such an easy name to say that people might be like Pip can you just look at can you just do this can you just you know act on this it's just come through how do you differentiate sort of work and play or or do you or what what helps you to sort of stay in your own sort of genius as it were oh you know it, uh, uh, it's probably the most challenging thing I've had to do over years um and I, I definitely haven't mastered it um to be honest I work is my life and life is my work um and you know that is the reality of the journey that I'm on you know I'm literally want to replace be the next LinkedIn and that's that's a a very (laughs) ambitious thing to come to. The thing I think I've found is that I have been very um I guess you know strategic in a way that I have chosen something that completely aligns what I'm passionate with, with what I'm good at, with what pays me, and also that brings purpose to my life. So I think, you know, it, it doesn't feel like work. Because I have, and there's actually a brilliant book, and hilariously, because I'm dyslexic, I'm not going to be able to pronounce it. It's something like Iyagi, or it's a, it's the Japanese kind of, it's a Japanese book. I'll send you the link. Mm-hmm. Um, that is so my dyslexia. Um, but it talks about finding a role that does just that. And the thing is, when you find that magic point that intersects what you get paid for, what you're good at, um, what brings you kind of joy and also purpose, you're not really working. So I, I don't really, I work all the time. I, I work six days a week. I have one day off for Sunday where I go completely on airplane mode. <laughs> but to be honest, I'd rather do that than anything else. Like I'm surrounded by a team I love. I'm doing something that I completely believe in. And, you know, everyone I kind of meet for work purposes are the sort of people I'd love to meet anyway. Yes. <laughs> so, um, so I get to go to gallery openings and go to amazing conferences and all the stuff that I would have prayed to go to if I wasn't doing this job. So, um, yeah, I, I have very little boundaries between my home and my, my work and my I, I'm sort of trying to move away from talking about work life balance because it implies that you don't enjoy what you do. And I. I start talking about work life blend. You know, if you find something that combines your passion it doesn't need to feel like work. And I think that's super important. Sundays on airplane mode are important though. That is yeah. quite my brain. <laughs> and also, like, I don't really need feel the need to just, you know, switch off from work immediately to watch EastEnders four times a week because it's, it doesn't creatively fulfill me. It doesn't light me up. Whereas other things, like, you know, people be like, I can't believe you're watching a TEDx talk at, you know, 10 o'clock at night. And it's like, no, but I, I like to go to bed with lots of ideas ideas cooking oh I think that's so true you know it's that whole like do you want to just sit down and watch something that's just numbing your brain or not I mean so yeah I think I, I, I've just been very lucky in finding that kind of career and I, I think that's at the root of what the dots is is also helping other people experience that too because yeah we spend so much of our time working we might as well love it <laughs> exactly how have you prepared for growth at kind of next stages so those moments I know we've touched on imposter syndrome or doing stuff out of your comfort zone um what helps you to stay really focused just before I guess that moment of where you jump as in open the door to go okay this is where we're going for investment this is you know this is quite an important meeting do you have any rituals or things that just really help you to stay grounded and centered I think the most important thing is the team to be honest so I think I've come to realize that my most important role as founder is to build and retain a world-class team because 
I can't know everything and I can't learn everything. And I think it's also, and I think this is a key female strength, is being very um, introspective and recognizing your strengths and weaknesses and where you're good and where you're not. And in terms of more of a, a, a way I, I, I learn a lot about myself was I do, I keep a post-it note on my, um, on my computer that basically says, you know, learnings from the past and mistakes not to repeat. But I also, when I left the loop to start the dots, I had a 360 review done myself, um, which was someone interviewed all my old team, um, shareholders, and produced a report that was like what I was good at, one page of what I was really good at. Wow. <laughs> what I was really rubbish at. <laughs> and the third page was learning from my previous business to apply to the dots. And I learned so much about myself, and it really made me go, you know, what am I not as good as, and how can I plug those gaps? And I guess then it's really been about making sure that I am surrounded by incredible senior team who can help me, but also incredible, like I have a portfolio of mentors who I can draw on. Um, and I think in that's been the most important thing because the, so many highs and lows starting a business and you make so many mistakes, especially if you're innovating, because you have to, that's mm -hmm. the nature of innovation. But if you're surrounded by people who share your vision and share your values, um, they can help you through all of those times and how to navigate raising investment, how to put together, you know, share option plans. All these kind of things are you can build a team around you that can help with that. And I think that's what I've got, I guess, quite good at over the years. <laughs> that, no, that's fantastic. And I think also it um, dispels the myth that we have to do it all by ourselves. Otherwise, we, we're not doing it properly. And that sense of being the control freak and attention to detail, I think sometimes it's just a bit overrated that we do need to share the load a little bit, especially if we're trying to do all the other things in our lives as well. Oh, completely. Um, you know, sharing the load, delegating is so important. The challenge, though, is you do need to make sure they're really good because there's nothing, because <laughs> it's, it's really hard yeah, otherwise, you know. So I think like that, that, that's the biggest challenge any founder will ever have is, is building a team because they, they've got to be the right team, but they've also got to show you values that you, they've got to share your vision, but they've also got to be better at you, better at everything than you are. So you feel <laughs> comfortable like handing it over. So, um, you know, but it's, it's what I love most is, is working with my team. That's amazing. <laughs> I've got one final question, which is where would you like to be in five years time in business and in life? Oh, 100% still running the dots. So this is, <laughs> I know. Can you imagine if you're like, no, I want to be a zookeeper. <laughs> I'm leaving it all. I'm, I'm my husband leaving. always laughs that if I sell it, I just start something again. Exactly the same. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, yeah. I mean, for me, this is a really long-term vision. I, I, you know, hats off to what LinkedIn has created, but I think it was built for another generation, and I really do want to be the next LinkedIn, and that's going to be a long journey. That's, you know, that's, that's a 15-year journey. Um, and so, gosh, in five years... I definitely, well, we, you know, over 31% of our community is already based outside of the UK. Um, and we work with 8,000 companies now that use us to build their brands and hire talent, but they are primarily in the UK. So it's definitely international expansion. So we, over this next year, we'll be looking to where we go next um, and how we build up getting more companies in different countries. Because in the end, creativity should be borderless and it is borderless. So, you know, for me, the dots only works if you can decide to move to Berlin and find opportunities there, or if you can decide that you want to move to Shanghai and find opportunities over there. So, yeah, you know, it's international expansion it will be on the cards, not this year, but in the coming years. And so, yeah, in five years, I definitely want to be all over the world. Um, and yeah, just still loving, loving the team I'm working with. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. Oh my goodness. I've learned so much from this and I feel like, um, I feel like we just need, we need to keep this conversation about creativity and actually how we make it work going so much. So I can't thank you enough, Pip. Thank you. And if people want to come and find out more, where should they go? So just go to the dots. And if you Google us, we're at the top, um, or just head to 
head to the app store and download the Dots app, which got featured by Apple about a week ago. So I you. saw. <laughs> How exciting. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so go down, load the app there. Um, it feels so. like a real, like, certificate moment because this podcast was on the top 100 business podcasts and I felt like I needed, like, a swimming badge, like, yes. yes. <laughs> or, like, you know, being in the Scouts or Brownies, like, I've now got my app badge or my <laughs> Apple badge. It's such a great moment, isn't it? It's so magic. It actually got, it was so funny because my husband's a crazy cyclist and he gets up really early to cycle. So he woke me up at four in the morning. He jumped on the bed. He was like, look, look, look. And I was oh, like, that's so... Um, and it was just, yeah, it, it, it was that magic moment because, you know, it gives you a reach that you can only ever do. I mean, we've, we've got, you know, nearly half a million members now, but at the same time, it's expanding that reach and it's just incredible to to, to have, have, have them supporting us. So, yeah. How did you celebrate? Oh my gosh, well, how did I celebrate? I think we all had champagne on a Monday morning. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I do my best work on a I Monday morning. I love how I say champagne. What I mean is Prosecco. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're recording this on a Monday morning. I'm sure. I'm just sorry that when I'm definitely not half baked here as I'm, as I'm talking to you. <laughs> oh my goodness well thank you Pip so much I know so many of my creative listeners will, will go over and check it out and they're probably members already as well so it's just lovely hearing the story behind the brand thank you so much thank you so much take Lovely. care see you soon bye thanks so much for listening to today's episode If you haven't already, feel free to rate, review and subscribe for all the brand new episodes. If you want to go deeper with my support, check out my freebies house and unlock the rooms you choose. NikkiRaby.com forward slash freebies house. I also have workshops, programs and one-on-one bespoke offerings. For prices, availability or just to have a chat with me, go to NikkiRaby.com. Thank you as always for spending some time with me and my guests and I'll see you next time.